So look at verse 20. The wine press was trodden without the city. So notice that it's outside the city. Now throughout the, uh, the entire book of Revelation, we've seen what that city is, or the holy city. The city is referring to Jerusalem. So outside Jerusalem, Jesus Christ will be trotting, see, stamping on this wine press of the unbelievers. So we can see that this battle where Jesus Christ is going to stomp out the blood of the unbelievers, he's going to be stamping them out outside the borderline of Jerusalem. It's going to take place. All the action will take place in Israel. And blood came out of the wine press. Well, yeah, I mean, if you keep trotting on in this wine press on these grapes, guess what? The juice comes out. That's why you, people are able to drink wine. But over here, it's going to be the blood of the unbelievers, even unto the horse bridles. Well, look at that over there. So the blood is going to go up high so deep that it's going to reach the horse's bridles. Why? Because Jesus Christ, if you look at Revelation chapter 19, we'll look at that a little later on, he's riding on a horse when he's trampling, when he's trampling on the unbelievers in great wrath. That's going to be pretty high then, the, the blood. Wow. By the space of 1,600 furlongs. Now, people calculated 1,600 furlongs to be almost 200 miles. So that is great wrath of Jesus Christ trampling upon the unbelieving world, and their blood is going to be so high that it's going to reach to the horse's bridles. Okay, now, you think about that for a while. That ain't the loving, gentle, meek, mild Jesus that you pictured at his first coming. His second coming, he's coming down as a roaring lion, and he's going to take vengeance and get back what rightfully belongs to his. Him. Why? Because for 2,000 years he's put up with enough garbage from the wicked world who's taken his name in vain, who rejected Jesus Christ, who rejected his holy word, who tolerated sin, wrong doctrine, and false gods. That's why. Now, we're going to look at a few passages over here. But before we look at a few passages, I want to mention real quickly that at verse... Over here, we looked at verse 14. It is distinguished from verse uh, 17, right? So there are two different events here, remember? Two different using the sickle for reaping. Wow, how about that? So it shows over here they're not the same event, okay? So people cannot confuse Christ's second coming as one and the same event. These are two different events where he's going to rapture the tribulation saints, and that's distinguished from Jesus Christ coming down on the earth taking vengeance on the unbelievers. They're not one and the same event. They're two different events because there's two different reapings going on. Okay, did you read verse uh, 15? Did you read verse 18? See, two different reapings. <coughs> Excuse me. So, since there are two different reapings going on, there are two different events. If people want to still put that the same event, you can because you'll notice when in here Jesus Christ is taking vengeance in great wrath. If you compare at Revelation 19, he's wearing many crowns and he's leaving his throne onto the earth to take vengeance. Whereas when you look at verse 14, look, he's sitting. He's sitting on the throne up in heaven with a golden crown. Did you see that over there? Did you see that over there? So notice over here that the, Jesus Christ is sitting up in heaven with a golden crown, and then he's reaping up the harvest of the earth. Whereas over here, Jesus Christ, he's coming down on the earth, taking vengeance, trampling out uh, the unbelievers in the wine press. See, there's a huge difference over here. 
there is a huge difference over here. Not only that, you'll notice over here that the angel is using the sickle. Whereas over here, Jesus Christ is using the sickle. So notice that these have to be two different events. Two different events. So uh, the Catholic Church, would they like to attack Christians concerning about adding different events within Jesus Christ's second coming? Their common argument is, well, that doesn't make sense. When you say Jesus Christ is coming the second time, how can you put a rapture for the church as one and then a rapture for tribulation saints as two? Jesus Christ coming down in Armageddon and wiping out the unbelievers three. See, that doesn't make sense. So he's coming down three different times. That doesn't make sense. Uh, isn't it supposed to be Jesus Christ's second coming? So it should be all mashed up in one event. Not three different events where you put at one second coming of Jesus Christ. That doesn't make sense. Well, it, in Jesus Christ's first coming, aren't there different events at Jesus Christ's first coming? His birth, his ministry, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and Jesus Christ rapturing up to heaven? How about that? And they're all different events. You can't mingle up Jesus Christ's ascension, his rapture up to heaven. You can't mingle that with his birth. Where, uh, likewise, you can't do the same thing here with Jesus Christ's second coming. You can't mingle all of this up together. By the way, here's a simple answer. His second coming, if you look at Acts chapter 1, it says his second coming will be in like manner where he's going to land on the earth. When Jesus Christ is rapturing up the church or rapturing up the tribulation saints, he did not land on the earth yet. See that? He did not land on the earth yet. So that's important to understand. Now, the only minor exception would probably be Revelation chapter 10. If that mighty angel, like I mentioned before, could be a reference to Jesus Christ with one foot uh, on the sea and one foot on the shore. However, the simple uh, answer to that one is just like the first coming, where you have different events where Jesus Christ was on the earth, that's not hard to believe with the second coming. So it doesn't change that fact. But if Revelation 10, that's not Jesus Christ, then the argument stands where the second coming, he's coming on the earth. He's landing on the earth. Okay, but now returning over here with this wine press, there are some scriptural references that you can look at. Now, we only have time to turn over there, so I'm just going to read it quickly, and you can write it down and Take a look at it. So Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 31, it says, For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. Verse 32, For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Verse 33, Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of ass. Wow, look, so then in Deuteronomy 32, it says their rock is not our rock. So I guess because it's so rich, I have to look at that passage real quickly. Okay, so Deuteronomy 32, it says their rock is not our rock. Well, wait a minute, which, which church and religion will say that the rock of their church is what? The Pope. Whereas the Christian's rock, we say, no, that should be the rock of the church is Jesus Christ. Why? This perfectly fits the Catholic Church, don't you think? Their rock is not our rock. Not only that, their vine is the vine of Sodom. Wait a minute. Isn't um, the Roman Catholic Church drinking the wine at the Mass and they claim that's the blood of Jesus? Hey, that vine is not our vine, the Christians. We believe that when we're partaking in the grape juice at the Lord's Supper, that that's symbolical of Jesus' blood. That's not literal. So their drink is not our drink over here. Notice it's called the vine of Sodom. Now, isn't that very interesting? The vine of Sodom. So the Antichrist city is called Sodom. So this is all a reference to what? The tribulation. 
it's all reference to the tribulation. Their wine is the poison of dragons, cruel venom of ass. Well, remember Revelation chapter 13 and chapter 12? The dragon, or the asp, the serpent Satan, he's coming down. So this is all tribulation reference over here. Also, Isaiah chapter 63 it is very rich, which we won't have time to read and turn to, but Isaiah chapter 62, verses 1 through 4 and verse 6, if you read that passage, it talks about Jesus Christ landing on the earth, and then the blood reaches all the way up to the borderline of his garments, and he's trotting on the winepress, and the, his garments are dipped red with blood. That's wow. Now, I promised a little while ago that we look at Revelation 19 later on. So notice Revelation 19, verse 13. Jesus' garment is dipped in blood. You'll notice over here, verse 15, he's treading on the winepress of the wrath of God. How about it? So he's taking vengeance. He's taking vengeance upon the unbelievers. You'll notice verse 12, it, it shows the distinction from the tribulation rapture. His head were many crowns. See that? And then you'll notice over here that at verse 11, and then you read from uh, verse 1 through 11, Jesus Christ is leaving heaven. He is leaving heaven to land on the earth. It shows the distinction once more. So that is going to be the great winepress of the wrath of God. Now, there are many, many references to to this wine press of the wrath of God, which I don't have time to turn to. But a lot of these passages, it, you might recall the Battle Hymn of the Republic, where it says uh, he's trampling on the uh, vineyards where the grapes of wrath are stored. Why Christians, Bible believers, shouldn't be singing that song? Because that was uh, written by some demon-possessed woman who was taking that reference where Christ is in great vengeance trampling out the unbelievers and that demon-possessed woman was trying to apply that to the soldiers of the South. Now the soldiers of the South, I know that the South had issues but these people, if you read their life stories and their generals, I mean Stonewall Jackson and as well as Robert E. Lee and etc. these people, they were people who were Bible believers. They memorized the book. They even did war tactics based on the Bible. So whether you agree with their politics or not, the point is, is that they were saved believers. As a matter of fact, if you want to get into the slavery and racism issue, I know that the South had, you can point out issues here and there with some of, some of their people, but you can point out the same thing with Lincoln and even General Grant. And then, uh, I've heard from some documentations. Actually, this is built. Uh, this is shown by historians, even in secular schools, where Robert E. Lee uh, freed all of his slaves. He didn't have slaves, whereas the uh, General of the Union, Grant, he kept his slaves. So there's a lot of uh, different things going on that uh, we that you'll notice is kind of where the mainstream schools and media has brainwashed our next generation. So you, so you can't believe everything that you're learning at schools. But the point is this. The point is, is that why sing that as part of a church hymn when that was talking, when that was a demon-possessed woman trampling out a lot of saved believers when that, when that song should be applying to unbelievers, God taking vengeance on them? I don't have a clean conscience singing that kind of a song when they were singing that song, uh, killing and murdering a lot of saved believers. Okay, so killing and murdering, that might be a strong word because war is war, right? So I get it. So they were uh, slaughtering each other based on war. But, you know, slaughtering saved believers while singing this song, when it's applying to unbelievers in God's wrath, nah, that, that's, that's not right. But there are so many passages, like I pointed out over here at Revelation chapter 14, concerning about this. You can look up these passages yourselves. Joel chapter 1 verse 15. Nahum chapter 1 verses 2 through 6. Psalms chapter 68 verse 23. 
Judges chapter 5, verse 21. Joel chapter 3, verse 13. Uh, Genesis chapter 49, verse 11. Uh, Isaiah chapter 34, verse 5. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 15. Man, that book will... It's, it's so much on the second advent. In vengeance. Taking vengeance. There's Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 30. You can also look at Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 2. I'm not sure if that passage may have any significance, but you can check that out. And then concerning about Jesus Christ, where he's rapturing the tribulation saints, here are the passages that you can look at where it talks about the harvest being ripe, ripe and then it's referring to the second coming. Isaiah chapter 17, verse 6, chapter 26, verse 20 through 21. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 9, James chapter 5 verse 7, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 39. So that should be rich with scriptures about Revelation chapter 14 with the rapture of the tribulation saints and with Jesus Christ taking vengeance on the unbelievers at his second advent, wiping them out.